Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. This is Sarah Liz, or as some know me, Mother Sarah, and I've got a sermon for you today. The quality is a bit different than this intro because it was recorded during a worship service. These are audio only recordings because that's what's manageable at this time. For more details concerning when, where, and what bits of the Bible were being preached on, look to the description below this video. I hope you enjoy the message. Here we go. So, this morning's gospel reading seems like a very clear, exciting, miracle story of healing. But Jesus is being kind of squirrely. And the nature of his squirreliness really comes out when we read this section of the letter to the Hebrews at the same time. Now, the letter to the Hebrews may not seem quite as clear as the very clear and obvious healing story from Luke. You're not wrong. <laughs> because the letters back then, they spoke in ways that we don't speak. They tried to explain concepts in ways we don't try to explain concepts. But let me distill for you what that little section of the letter of Hebrews is trying to tell us, and was trying to tell the people in those ancient times. That portion of the letter to the Hebrews, now it is the letter to the Hebrews, so these are ostensibly Jewish people who are hearing it, is trying to convince them that their own ancient religion is wrong. And that's, you know, that's a little touchy. It's a bit of a touchy subject. What if I came into your house and told you everything you assumed was wrong? Um, you might ask me to stay for coffee. You might not. So this is a bit of a touchy thing. So everything you assume is wrong, oh, but not everything. Because the writer of Hebrews cherry picks to the best and most interesting bits of all of the old Hebrew scriptures and applies them to Jesus and for the rest says, oh no, you don't have to worry about that. So here we have insult number two. Everything you believe is wrong. Well, not everything. A few things apply to this guy that I'm selling you right now. It's like a vacuum salesman from hell. <laughs> That's what's going on here. Do we always have to convince people that Jesus Christ is here to help us in this way? No, we don't. We don't always have to insult their heritage. We really don't. But one of the things that the writer of Hebrews was trying to do was to place this person, Jesus, who was a Jew himself and who lived in those times, was trying to place him both like one foot in the Jewish camp and one foot over on the other shore as something different, something new. So he comes from all of this Jewish tradition, but then he's got one foot in something else. It's a little like, it's a little like one of my high school friends. Her name is Shay. She's quite a character. Now, this particular high school friend, she was raised in Williamsville, which if you don't know, Williamsville is a very hoity-toity northern suburb of Buffalo. And she comes from what her parents have told her is an ancient family. And she has pointed out all families are ancient. But they can, they can trace their lineage back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, back to the 14th century. <clears throat> it's a bit precious but it's meant to be a bit precious here. So her parents put her through debutante school. Now, this was just one of my high school friends. This was not someone who lived like in Manhattan. This was not someone who lived in the most expensive Chicago suburb. This was my buddy. So Shay went through debutante school and Shay has one foot firmly in everything that is polite and all the things that one must do to be absolutely, positively polite in every kind of society. 
and then Shay rebelled. <clears throat> Scroll forward 10 years later, the next time I meet Shay, Shay is in a hippie commune in downtown Buffalo. My husband knew Shay before I knew my husband. She is our one truly mutual friend. So over here with Shay's other foot, firmly in the hippie commune, where one does not even flush the toilet every time one uses it, oh yes, it's that kind of commune. I have eaten meals with Shay, and I can tell you that she can turn on the table manners, and she can turn off the table manners. She can turn on all of the politeness, and the kindness, and, and the gentility, and she can turn it off. So this is my perfect example of someone who has one foot in one world, and one foot in the other. The church that she attends, is the premier Presbyterian church in all of Buffalo. It is Westminster Presbyterian. And when she goes to church with her parents at Westminster Presbyterian, she is firmly in the polite world, <laughs> firmly. And when she leaves church and walks the four blocks, her parents have to drive all the way back to Williamsville, but she has to walk the four blocks to the hippie commune that she's lived in on and off, oh, for years. I only lived there for two and a half years, but still. Then she goes back into this other world. So this is a little bit of what Hebrews is trying to explain to us. That Jesus is in two different worlds. He's in this Jewish world. I'm just going to call it a little uptight. There are a lot of rules. There are a lot of rules. He's in this Jewish world full of rules that, you know, like the rules of politeness, They've got some really good underpinnings. I've had a lot of discussions with my husband about this because he was raised with parents who rebelled from all the rules of you know, having manners in society. And so when I got to him, he held his knife and fork and spoon like this. And I'm just like, oh my god. I couldn't deal with it. And so for the last eight years, we've been having ongoing discussions about why manners matter and what's, where does that manners, where does that little bit of polite rule? Where does it come from? Why shouldn't you just eat with your mouth wide open? Well, let's discuss it. So a lot of the Jewish rules have really good foundations. And there are a lot of them. Just like a lot of the rules of polite society have some really good foundations. Well, A, if you chew with your mouth open, you might choke to death and then I'll laugh at you because you were chewing your, with your mouth open. And B, if you chew with your mouth open, then I have to see your food, and I don't want to see your food. It's a personal thing. And C, if you chew with your mouth open, you might accidentally spit on me, and I don't need your mashed potatoes. <laughs> so there are many reasons why you shouldn't chew with your mouth open. These are the sorts of conversations that we sometimes have with like four-year-olds who are like, no, why? But we can have them with adults, too. So there are a lot of good reasons why there are so many very specific Jewish laws. But like with manners, you can take them to a crazy place. You can get really uptight with them. You can lose the purpose of having the manners. And as I discuss frequently with my husband, in, at least in my mind, the purpose of having manners is to have agreed upon set of rules for social interaction so I don't accidentally offend you and you don't accidentally offend me. We've got an agreed upon set of rules. So if I act inside this circle, you know, even if I accidentally kick you in the shins and step on your face, that I didn't mean to. <laughs> and you could probably discuss it with me and say, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I wonder if you noticed that you seem to have just kicked me in the shins and stepped on my face. And I, I do wonder if you could stop that. <laughs> so they're polite ways of saying this instead of, hey, dirtbag, why are you kicking me in the shins? Why did you step on my face? And if you address a situation like that, you're only going to make it worse. <laughs> 
polite society can be useful. Do we all need to wear elbow length white gloves? No, I don't think so. And maybe that's where it goes a little too far. The whole point of Jesus' gospel is that woman who's crippled and had been so for 18 years and, you know, they're hanging out on the Sabbath. Did you notice she didn't ask to be healed? Like every other healing in scripture, the person who is wounded or ill or desperate, they are begging Jesus to heal them, and he does. This woman didn't say anything. This woman didn't ask. It was the Sabbath after all. Jesus went up to her. Jesus asked her. Jesus spontaneously healed her. Now, was she going to give the healing back? No. She instantly started praising God, possibly leaping for joy because she wasn't crippled anymore. But this was the one situation of healing that Jesus went out and was an instigator. And he did it on the Sabbath, and he did it on purpose. Which reminds me a little bit of like children in the backseat of the car. He's touching me, he's touching me, he's touching me. No, I'm not. And their finger is that far away. It's that far away. Mom, he's touching me. They're doing it on purpose to see how far the rules really go. Jesus did it on purpose because they were taking that rule too far. Because there's all kinds of rules about what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. You can't make anything, you can't destroy anything. So that goes all the way to making dinner. <laughs> Have fun with that, you gotta do it ahead of time. And you can't destroy anything, so you can't cut cloth. You can't cut hair. You can't cut string because it destroys what it was before. You can't light a candle because you are making fire. You can't make anything, you can't destroy anything. But you still gotta eat. Your cattle still have to eat. So yeah, you can still untie them. You can still do the basic necessities of life. They recognize that. But they were really getting kind of crazy, like elbow length white gloves, with what you can and cannot do. And they were imposing it on people's life. It reminds me a little bit of a place that is under Sharia law where people don't want Sharia law because Sharia law can be very restrictive. It's not always, but it can be. Jewish law can be very restrictive. It's not always, but it can be. It can be interpreted that way. Polite manners can be very restrictive, but they don't have to be, but they can be interpreted that way. I don't know, sometimes I like to put my elbows on the kitchen table. <laughs> Would I do it in front of my mother? No. Is my mother already dead? Yes. I can put my elbows on my own kitchen table now. It's fantastic. <laughs> but my point here is that Jesus went out, he sought a situation, and he poked his brother in the back seat to show you that it's actually not that bad. And in that moment, he redefined what the Sabbath means. You can still help people. God is not saying there's a day on which you may not help people. God is not saying that there is a day on which you may not heal people and be compassionate to people. Now, we don't observe the Sabbath quite like that. And as Christians, we never really have. There was a great debate in the first and second and third centuries on whether or not we should, and they came down on the, no, <laughs> no, we don't need to. So what does this mean for us? It's not that Jews are so bad that they create restrictive laws. It's not that Muslims are so bad that they create restrictive laws. It's a human thing. Humans create restrictive laws. Now, we do it for very good reasons. We do it for very good reasons. To protect people, to keep people safe, to keep people healthy, 
Absolutely. And we can also take some of our rules and our regulations, some of the laws, sure, but also some of the assumed things, like why are they doing that? Why is Mother Sarah wearing black Doc Martens before Labor Day? Because I am. Because I found them for $30 at Ambets yesterday, and I'm so thrilled with myself, I can't even speak. But I am wearing um, really dark shoes before Labor Day, and I'm a woman, and I'm doing it anyway. The point is that humans can create restrictive rules and sometimes they make good sense, and sometimes they don't. And Jesus has given us permission to do a little civil disobedience, and when we find a rule that doesn't make sense, that is unfair, that is unjust, that is completely bizarre and bonkers, it is okay to break it, but look how he breaks it. He doesn't break it being violent. He doesn't break it getting crazy. He breaks it by loving people. He breaks it by being kind. He breaks it by healing a woman who has been desperate for the last 18 years. This is our model. When we find injustice, when we find rules that don't make sense, whether they're really big rules or really small rules, we can break them, but we need to break them like Jesus. We need to break them with love. We need to break them with compassion. We need to break them in order to heal and help another person. Jesus was not an anarchist. He was a monarchist in the grandest sense. He believed in the kingdom of God. But he also believed in the overwhelming power of love. Because when we love everyone in an overwhelming sense, the rules can melt away and our world is better. Is that anarchist? Not any anarchists I've met, and I actually have met several in the hippie commune I mentioned earlier. <laughs> it doesn't matter where we are on the political spectrum. It doesn't matter where we are on the law-abiding spectrum. It doesn't matter if we put our elbows on the table while we eat, or we refrain, thank you very much, from putting our elbows on the table while we eat. What matters is are we doing what we're doing with love? Amen. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Sometimes a sermon can lift us up and sometimes it can leave us thinking. And sometimes we can walk away seriously challenged. This is totally normal, and you're not alone. We're supposed to be comforted and challenged by God in turns. And today may be your turn. See you next time.